Greetings, ladies and mantle gents, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales of the Space. Space. And as always, I hope that you enjoy. Story number one. We wondered, are they friends? And Earth said, yes. Written by Lone Noble. I declare this cycle session resolved. The assorted representatives may now leave the sanctum. Enjoy your afternoons, everyone. Slowly, the various species picked themselves up from their thrones, hover seats, and platforms, and began to chatter amongst themselves. Some were making friendly gestures with their various appendages and discussing new plans. Some were glaring at one another in challenge, and a few species focused on the greatest efficiency were already sorting files on their pads and preparing to head to another meeting. Myself. I was beaming over the overseer's chair, glad for the session to be over, and proud of the accomplishments of the day. More food for the refugees of Zerthax, after a great storm had caused a famine on the already fragile desert biomes of the newly founded colony. Increased funding for architecture on developing worlds and essential projects. An accord between Zythans and the Ogrods, bringing the two species closer than ever before with shared migration policy. Oh, and how could I forget the formalized welcome of humanity to the Galactic Consortium? It was all a formality, of course, and we all knew it. Humanity had long since integrated with the rest of us at a pace much faster than any before them had been able to do, impressing the elder races and fledglings alike. We'd be alarmed at the rate of their advancement if it were anyone else. But the peoples of humanity had already proved themselves valuable allies to our governments and close friends to our peoples. I felt my gaze draw to the three human representatives laughing between themselves and some of the Zythans who were about to leave. Typical, I supposed. No human would have let a friend leave after an event like this without a hearty congratulations. Affectionate bunch, they are. Of course, it wasn't always that way for us all. It feels like an eternity now. But it was not so long ago that we had first contact between ourselves and the unified human worlds. It was a time of great but upheaval and turmoil. Those contacts were hardly out of the ordinary, of course. It was a large universe, and the consortium was ready to face whatever mystery presented itself next. But humanity had taken longer than most to find its way to our borders. They already had hundreds of colony worlds, and a large fleet normally only associated with warlords and particularly violent species. We were worried there would be a war with a new hostile power, and... As we raced to translate the message they sent us, we worked our engineers overtime to manufacture some of our experimental weapons, anything, to give us an edge over the surprise power of the cosmos. Fortunately, for everyone involved, the translators worked faster than the engineers, and the humans made clear their intentions of peaceful coexistence long before our new weapons even approached the diplomatic vessel that we had mistaken for a warship. Apparently, Humanity had been birthed on a rather violent world, and they'd learned that it was better to be protected and not needed than needed protection and not have it. This horrified the efficiency-oriented species, of course. Such a waste of resources over a non-existent threat. But the more cunning and more militaristic species and governments could only find themselves in agreement with our new friends. All of this was, of course, wonderful news. We were glad of the declaration of intentions, but we hadn't survived by being stupid or taking well-armed strangers at their word. We were all very much on edge, even as the humans invited us to send an ambassador to their home world for a diplomatic visit. There was even talk of it being myself as the overseer. But sadly, it was decided that I held too much importance to be risked heading to a potentially hostile world. It's a shame... From what the ambassador said of it, I'd have liked to have gone. In the early years of Earth, before humanity had the power of technology, it was an untamed world where a single misstep would kill you. Many of our own strongest members would not have survived there had they originated there. 
When the ambassador arrived, thankfully, the weather was clear and sunny, the people friendly, if loud, and the temperature moderate enough for many of our species to be quite comfortable. A nice day for a historic moment. The ambassador was already unconcerned. He trusted humanity at their word, which is why he volunteered to go. But the rest of us were unconvinced until he brought back the greatest revelation he'd gotten from his trip. The truly important part of the visit was in the assurances of the politicians of Earth, the offers of gifts of resources from the distant colonies to help start up some of our own, the attempt to set up an early migration pact, one we could now get to organizing, now the formalities were passed, thankfully. Nor was the eagerness of the people to meet us. All of them were fantastic signs, but a people can be fickle, and ideologies can turn like an asteroid orbiting a star. What really sold us on humanity's benevolence was the scent. Everywhere the ambassador went, it was absolutely overpowering. Later diplomats concurred with the initial report from our first contact specialist. It was a pleasant aroma that the humans cannot, apparently, pick up. It's a mix of various creatures of the world mocking humanity, both predator and prey. What sold us was a universal agreement between man and animal that they were friends. Humanity was the protector of Earth and the bulwark of nature, custodian to all life that resides in the cradle world. And though the humans could not notice the way that we could, the world was showing its gratitude. The message was clear. Humanity was decidedly a friend to life beyond its own species, long before they built their own spacecraft. Many of our species considered themselves the protectors of life on their worlds, of course, and we'd seen the phenomenon on a smaller scale. Some of them had animal companions at their sides, and many had large, wonderfully maintained biomes of life on their worlds. But none before had the total unifying agreement from such a variety of life. It did not matter where we were on the world or what creatures were nearby. The scent was there, marked strongly on every human settlement, be it surrounded by jungle, desert, plains, or if it was contained under water. Every creature, whether it flew, swam, or prowled, clearly recognized the special role of their benefactors. It was not uncommon to see humans showing affection to an animal on its lap or wandering its house. And there was also endless footage dating back nearly a thousand years on the intergalactic network of humans treating wild creatures the same way. From wolves to eels and fish to seals and birds and even insects. The friendship was substantial and beyond anything that we had ever seen. The humans don't understand the significance of the Sokos, as they become a new shining star in our consortium. They just assume that we're super-friendly alien pals that they've always been waiting for. They never saw our initial paranoia, the weapons we'd prepared for a worst case. Few have gone back to see the articles that spoke of war from various media sources. Sometimes, the ignorance of it can be rather amusing to me, as I remember the initial panic. The lovable species who made friends with an entire planet before they reached the stars haven't picked up on the fact that they might be the friendly ones, and we might be the blessed ones to have them. And so, I rose from my chair, and my elation only rose with me. The humans would probably say, I felt like I was floating, and the pun would be entirely intended. But that was the nature of being aquatic and needing an anti-gravity belt to travel land. Humanity now had the potential to become more than they already were, and the universe would change with it. If they could muster half the bravery we'd seen on their network, from firefighters breaking down burning doors to save children within, to doctors charging into war zones to extract wounded men and women, to soldiers sacrificing themselves for others. Well, if they could muster any of that, then we might have to mark them down as our friends too. And the future may be most bright, indeed. End of story. Story number two. 
Mac and Cheese, written by DM of the Tomb. Human James, what are you doing with those food rations? Oh, hey, Plinko, Panicko, I'm making mac and cheese. What is this mac and cheese you speak of? Is it a mandatory part of the human diet? Did we miss something on the nutrients list? Calm down, calm down. I'm just making it because I felt like a change of food tonight. No need to worry about human James. You are using nearly a week's worth of the ship's rations right now. Are you to tell me that you are going to consume so many calories in a single meal? Well, uh... Yes, human James. No, me James. Yes, no, I'm fucking making mac and cheese, and nobody can stop me. End of story. The algorithm reckons you should be watching this video next, and I recommend that you should be always watching my video. So, click and click with energy! And yes, clicking that does help the channel. Thank you very much. I would just like to give a quick thanks to the T5 channel members and patrons. Alithia, Parky, Fudicure, Meridian117, Cam Maxwell, Casper Arnholtz, Angry Marine, Lord Azrakal, and White Van 420